Chapter Ten of Adeline Mowbray by Amelia Alderson Opie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pam Moscato. Chapter Ten. But Glenmary's heart needed no explanation of the cause of Adeline's elopement. She was with him, with him, as she said, forever. True, she had talked of flying from misery and dishonor, but he knew they could not reach her in his arms not even dishonor according to the ideas of society, for he meant to make Adeline legally his as soon as they were safe from pursuit, and his illness was forgotten in the fond transport of the present moment. Adeline's joy was of a much shorter duration. Recollections of a most painful nature were continually recurring. True it was that it was no longer possible for her to reside under the roof of her mother, but was it necessary for her to elope with Glen Murray, the man whom she had solemnly promised her mother to renounce? Then on the other side she argued that the appearance of love for Glen Murray was an excuse sufficient to conceal from her deluded parent the real cause of her elopement. It was my sole alternative, said she mentally. My mother must either suppose me an unworthy child, or know Sir Patrick to be an unworthy husband and it will be easier for her to support the knowledge of the one than of the other. Then, when she forgives me, as no doubt she will in time, I shall be happy, but that I could never be while convinced that I had made her miserable by revealing to her the wickedness of Sir Patrick. While this was passing in her mind, her countenance was full of such anxious and mournful expression that Glenmurray, unable to keep silence any longer, conjured her to tell him what so evidently weighed upon her spirits. The difficulty that oppressed me is past, she replied, wiping from her eyes the tears which the thought of having left her mother so unexpectedly and for the first time produced. I have convinced myself that to leave home and commit myself to your protection was the most proper and virtuous step that I could take. I have not obeyed the dictates of love, but of reason. I am very sorry to hear it, said Glenmurray mournfully. It seems to me so very rational to love you, returned Adeline tenderly, shocked at the sad expression of his countenance, that what seem to be the dictates of reason may be those of love only. To a reply like this Glenmurray could only answer by those incoherent yet intelligible expressions of fondness to the object of them, which are so delightful to lovers themselves, and so uninteresting to other people. Nay, so entirely was Glenmurray again engrossed by the sense of present happiness that his curiosity was still suspended, and Adeline's story remained untold. But Adeline's pleasure was dampened by the painful recollections, and still more by her not being able to hide from herself the mournful consciousness that the ravages of sickness were but too visible in Glenmurray's face and figure, and that the flush of unexpected delight could but ill conceal the hollow paleness of his cheek and the sunk appearance of his eyes. Meanwhile the chaise rolled on, post succeeded to post, and though night was far advanced, Adeline, fearful of being pursued, would not consent to stop, and they travelled till morning. But Glen Murray, feeling himself exhausted, prevailed on her for his sake to alight at a small inn on the roadside near Marlborough. There Adeline narrated the occurrences of the past day but with difficulty could she prevail on herself to own to Glenmurray that she had been the object of such an outrage as she had experienced from Sir Patrick. A truly delicate woman feels degraded, not flattered, by being the object of libertine attempts, and, situated as Adeline and Glenmurray now were, to disclose the insult which had been offered to her was a still more difficult task, but to conceal it was impossible. She felt that even to him some justification of her precipitated and unsolicited flight was necessary, and nothing but Sir Patrick's attempt could justify it. She, therefore, blushing and hesitating, revealed the disgraceful secret, but such was its effect on the weak spirits and delicate health of Glenmurray, that the violent emotions which he underwent brought on a return of his most alarming symptoms, and in a few hours Adeline, bending over the sick bed of her lover, experienced for the first time that most dreadful of feelings, fear for the life of that object of her affection. Two days, however, restored him to comparative safety, and they reached a small and obscure village within a short distance from Falmouth, 
most conveniently situated. They took up their abode, and resolved to remain till the wind should change, and enable them to sail for Lisbon. In this retreat, situated in air as salubrious as that of the south of France, Glenmurray was soon restored to health, especially as happy love was now his, and brought back the health of which hopeless love had contributed to deprive him. The woman whom he loved was his companion and his nurse, and so dear had the quiet scene of their happiness become to them, that forgetful there was still a danger of their being discovered. It was with considerable regret that they received a summons to embark, and saw themselves on their voyage to Portugal. But before she left England, Adeline wrote to her mother. After a pleasant and short voyage, the lovers found themselves at Lisbon, and Glenmurray, pursuant to his resolution, immediately proposed to Adeline to unite himself to her by the indissoluble ties of marriage. Nothing could exceed Adeline's surprise at this proposal. At first she could not believe Glenmurray was in earnest, but seeing that he looked not only grave but anxious, and as if earnestly expecting an answer, she asked him whether he had convinced himself that what he had written against marriage was a tissue of mischievous absurdity. Glenmurray, blushing with the conceit of an author, replied that he still thought his arguments unanswerable. Then, if you still are convinced your theory is good, why let your practice be bad? It is incumbent on you to act up to the principles that you profess, in order to give them their proper weight in society, else you give the lie to your own declarations. But it is better for me to do that, than for you to be the sacrifice to my reputation. I replied Adeline, am entirely out of the question. You are to be governed by no other law but your desire to promote general utility, and are not to think at all of the interest of an individual. How can I do so when the individual is dearer to me than all the world besides? cried Glenmurray passionately. And if you but once recollect that you are dearer to me than all the world besides, you will cease to suppose that my happiness can be affected by the opinion entertained of my conduct by others. As Adeline said this, she twisted both her hands in his arm so affectionately, and looked up in his face with so satisfied and tender an expression, that Glenmurray could not bear to go on with a subject which evidently drew a cloud across her brow, and hours, days, weeks, and months passed rapidly over their heads before he had resolution to renew it. Hours, days, weeks, and months spent in a manner most dear to the heart and most salutary to the mind of Adeline, her taste for books, which had hitherto been cultivated in a partial manner, and had led her to one range of study only, was now directed by Glenmurray to the perusal of general literature, and the historian, the biographer, the poet, and the novelist, obtained alternately her attention and her praises. In her knowledge of the French and Italian languages, too, she was now considerably improved by the instruction of her lover and while his occasional illnesses were alleviated by her ever watchful attentions her attachment was cemented by one of the strongest of all ties the consciousness of mutual benefit and assistance end of chapter ten recording by pam moscato